Hey all you stinky people, it's me, Stinky Boy McGee, and today we're reading Sea Barneys again. Part 2, baby. Uh, it's It's been weird so far. It's been pretty weird, but not necessarily bad. It's been well written, it seems like the story knows where it's going, um, the characters are pretty alright. It's just, you know, not very FNAF, which is the problem with all these stories. So we'll see if it gets better, if it gets worse, I don't know, I'm, I'm liking it so far. It's just a bit strange. Uh, not my favorite, but uh, let's continue. We left in kind of a weird random, random spot. Um, basically, Mott had just started hearing the sea bonnie start talking to him. That's pretty much it. Everything else has been character stuff. Uh, Mott turned Rory around and gave him a gentle push out into the hallway. His mom got off the phone and looked at her sons. Are we ready? Let's get out of here, Mott said. He winced at his mom's strange look. I mean, let's go. Mott was in no hurry to get home that afternoon, but he couldn't come up with a decent excuse to be late. His mom had asked him to, to bike over to the grade school and escort Rory home. And she'd asked him to look after Rory until she got home later that evening. He'd promised he would do that. If he broke his promise, it would mess up her work. Mott had hoped that when he got home, he could get Rory to play outside, but rain started coming down on their way home and it was steady by the time they put their bikes away. Go get dried off, Mott said to Rory. Then come to my room, and I'll help you with your homework. No, you come to my room, Rory said. I'm supposed to write a poem about something I have that I like a lot. I'm going to write about my sea bonnies. You have to help me. Oh, joy, Mott said. Mott was a little unnerved and noticed his hands were shaking when he left his backpack in his room. Really? He was afraid of tiny, squirming sea critters confined to a glorified fishbowl? Get a grip, he breathed as he went down the hall into Rory's room. Rory sat at his desk, a piece of paper in front of him, a pencil grasped tightly in his right hand. He was staring rapidly at the sea bonnies. Mott eyed the tank warily. For a few seconds after his gaze landed on the sea bonnies, they swam around normally. Then, as if they all realized he was in the room, they suddenly shot to the end of the tank and lined up in formation. Hundreds of pin-sized black eyes appeared to be focused directly on him. Rory! What? Rory's gaze didn't leave the tank. Do you see what they're doing? Mott asked. Huh? Rory looked over at Mott. The sea bonnies. See how they're all lined up? Rory looked at the sea bonnies. They were milling about separately. Mott felt a growl-like sound rise up in his throat. The little monsters, they were messing with him. You're so easy to mess with, a chorus of whispers tickled his ears. Mott clamped his hands over his ears and started humming. He wasn't sure how long he stood there humming, probably not long. Rory was capable for sitting still for only a nanosecond or so. He couldn't have been waiting at his desk for long before he started yanking on Mott's shirt. Mott opened his eyes and looked at his brother. What, Rory? What's a word that rhymes with love? Above, dove... Mott chewed the inside of his cheek. That's all I can think of right now. Above works. Stupid, the whispers said again. I need to go to the bathroom, Mott told Rory. Stay in here and behave. When you're done with your poem, come and get me in my room. But, Rory began. Mott didn't wait. He bolted down the hall and escaped into the bathroom. He wasn't sure how long he remained in the small, white-tiled room. He didn't need to use the toilet, so he sat on the edge of the tub and stared at the fish-patterned blue and white wallpaper. He shivered. Was it fish in general that was weirding him out now? He gazed at the wallpaper. Would the blue fish whisper at him too? He waited. No, no whispers. That was because the sounds weren't in his head or at least they weren't being manufactured in his head. The sounds were coming from the sea bonnies, he was sure of it. Mott? Rory shouted through the door. He pounded on the door so hard it rattled in its frame. I'm ready. Mott sighed and stood. Taking a deep breath, he opened the door. Come look, Rory said. He motioned for Mott to follow him back to his bedroom. I said you can read it in my room, Mott said. Rory turned and shook his head. No, you have to come see this, it's super duper coolio. Mott swallowed and accompanied Rory. In Rory's room, Rory walked over to the fish tank and began reading. When I saw my sea bonnies, I felt love. It was a gift from Freddy above. They're super cool and they make me glad. I like that, because I hate being sad. Rory pointed to the sea bonnies and looked over at Mott with a face shining with happiness. See, he said, they'd like it. Mott made himself look in the tank. Oh, man. As much as the sea bonnies seemed to dislike Mott, they seemed to love Rory. They were all in formation again, lined up in the glass in front of Mott's little brother. Their little see-through tails were shimmying in unison. 
Well, at least the revolting little monsters are nice to my brother, Mott thought. It's a good poem, Mott said to Rory. Rory turned to beam at him. Behind Rory, the sea bonnies darted, as one, to the end of the aquarium, and they all focused on Mott. Or, again, it looked like they did. Do you want to play my video game with me? Mott asked Rory. Really? Sure. Rory ran toward Mott, his sea bonnies and his poem momentarily forgotten. Mott hummed as he and Rory trotted down the stairs. Behind him, whispers reached for his ears, but he hummed louder and refused to listen. Mott managed to avoid his brother's room for the rest of the evening. When his mother got home, he told her Rory had been restless, so Mott hadn't had time to do his homework. She took over Rory duty, and Mott retreated to his room. Because, distressingly, he could still hear the faintest of whispers in his own room. He put his earbud and listened to music while he studied. He kept in the earbuds while he got ready for bed, taking them out only for a couple of minutes to say goodnight to his mom. Then he went to bed wearing the earbuds. When he got up the next morning, he went from earbuds to shower to earbuds to out the door. He avoided breakfast by telling his mom he had to get to school early to meet with Nate and Lyle so they could talk about an upcoming history project. The truth was, their history project was weeks away, but he figured a lie in the interest of remaining sane was a lie worth telling. Over lunch, sitting with his friends eating his cheese sandwich, he thought about telling them what was going on, but he knew his friends. They didn't share more than one serious bone between them. Mostly, they were one big laugh fest. There was no way they'd do anything but make fun of Mott if he told him what he thought about the sea bonnies. After algebra that afternoon, he briefly considered telling Teresa about his experience with the sea bonnies. He knew she was as grossed out by them as he was, so she might be inclined to believe him, but... Maybe next weekend, she asked him. Mott realized he'd missed all of whatever she'd just told him. I'm sorry, he said. My head was someplace else. Yeah. Teresa laughed. I do that all the time. I mean, we're going capping this weekend, but I was wondering if you'd like to get together next weekend and study. I'm having trouble with two variable linear equations. You seem to be getting it. I was hoping you could help me. She looked really pretty today. Of course she did. Of course she did. It's the typical romance subplot that we see in every Fazbear Fright story. I bet either she's going to die or he's going to die. No one's making it out of this unscathed either way. Her shiny hair was caught back in a yellow scarf that matched her short dress. Mott grinned. Sure. He'd help her shove her manure if it, she asked. He didn't think telling a pretty girl that you think tiny mutant brine shrimp was whispering to you was a good way to impress her. He kept his fears to himself. If only he could stay away from home. But he couldn't. His mom was used to him enjoying being at home. He spent most of his afternoons with Rory and most of his evenings with his mom, when she wasn't at an event. She would find it bizarre if he suddenly wanted to stay over with Nate or Lyle, and his friends would too. He'd just have to avoid Rory's room. This plan worked for much of the evening. He got Rory involved in another video game in the living room, then he suggested they all play a board game after dinner. When the game concluded, Mott started to tell his mom he had a headache. Unfortunately, she beat him to it. Can you get Rory ready for bed, Mott? His mom held a palm to the side of her head. I have a tension headache and I need to lie down. Mott's reluctance must have shown in his face. She frowned when she looked at him and said, I'll give you extra allowance this week. Mott shook his head. Forget that, it's okay. Sorry, I was just... Never mind. Of course I'll get him to bed. Let's read Foxy and Bonnie on the high seas, Rory shouted. Mott's mom drew away from the sound and headed out of the room. Dial it down, buddy, Mott said. Mom has a headache. Oh. Rory turned to watch their mom go up the stairs. Sorry, mom, he yelled. Mott shook his head and ruffled Rory's hair. Rory emitted his multisyllabic Mott and galloped up the stairs. Mott turned off all the lights, checked that all the doors were locked, the security system was on, and then he followed his brother up to the second floor. A long 20 minutes later, Mott had Rory settled and in bed. You need to get to sleep, Mott told his brother. He handed Rory the plush Freddy Fazbear he liked to sleep with. Nope, Rory said. Read. He clutched Freddy and pointed to his nightstand. The book he'd referred to earlier was lying under a rolled-up comic book, a slingshot, and a half-empty package of gum. Yeah, read, the whispers commanded. Mott ground his teeth, but he reached for the book. He knew better than to try to leave Rory's room without reading to him. Rory was quite capable of pitching an ear-splitting fit, and if he did that, it would delay Mott's exit from the room even longer. So he reached for the book and pulled it out, sending the slingshot and the gum to the floor. He didn't bother to pick them up, he just started reading where he last left off. He read fast and he read loudly, but Rory didn't seem to care. He listened rapidly for several minutes, and then his eyes began to droop. Mott kept reading loudly, he was almost shouting. Just as he had been with his silly antics earlier, 
He was trying to drown out the whispers. Thankfully, Rory could sleep through a hurricane. He burrowed down under the covers, tucked Freddy under his chin, and closed his eyes tightly. In seconds, Mott could hear Rory's little kid snores, even over the shouted reading. Mott stopped reading, laid the book on the nightstand, and stood all in one motion. He was ready to get out of here. He turned off the wagon wheel lamp on the nightstand, but the room didn't go dark. Rory had a nightlight plugged in near his door, and the fish tank had a light, which was still on. Mott turned and prepared to sprint out of the room. Namby Pamby, the whispers taunted. Mott froze. Feeling like he couldn't back down from a challenge made by something as small as a sea bonnie, he turned to glare at the hideous things. Expecting to see them glare back, he was surprised to find them all clustered together near the back of the tank. He started to walk by, but then he did a double take. They weren't just clustered together, they were clustered around Fritz. They were attacking him. Mott made a beeline for the fish tank to save Fritz, but he realized there was nothing he could do without a net. He looked around wildly. Where was that net he used to remove Fritz when he had to clean up the fish tank? Mott started opening Rory's desk drawers, and then he snapped his fingers. Rory had taken the thing into the bathroom. He'd been playing with it in the tub. Mott tore out of Rory's room. He raced down the hall to the bathroom. Yep, there was the net. It was just sitting on the side of the tub. Grabbing it, Mott ran back into Rory's room. He charged over to the fish tank. As Mott reached for the tank's lid, he froze. The sea bonnies were nowhere near Fritz. They were swimming around in the tank, acting like... Well, acting like normal sea bonnies. And Fritz was swimming around by himself. He looked just fine. Had Mott imagined what he'd seen? Mott leaned closer to be sure Fritz was okay. He appeared to be... Mott blinked and frowned. Fritz was not okay. Fritz was different. He didn't appear to be orange anymore. What had the sea bonnies done to him? Ignoring his distaste for the sea bonnies, Mott went over to the tank to get a closer look at the goldfish. Up close, it was clear that not only was Fritz's color off, his shape was weird too. Now a faded blue, not unlike the color of the sea bonnies, Fritz was a little lumpy as if he'd... No, hang on. He wasn't lumpy. Mott gasped, but he couldn't pull himself away from the tank. He had to see. He leaned closer, putting his face almost up to the glass. Fritz was drifting lazily through a cluster of sea bonnies toward the back of the tank. Mott had to wait until Fritz turned to circle toward the front of the tank. He remained still, almost holding his breath, as the no longer goldfish came his way. As soon as Fritz swam toward the front wall of the tank, Mott's stomach turned. He covered his mouth as he stared at the fish. Mott had been right when he'd first seen it. Fritz wasn't just lumpy. Something was moving inside Fritz. Not inside. Mott squirmed at the fish as it swam past the glass. Something was moving on the outside, too. All of Fritz was in motion as if... Oh, gross. Mott backed away from the tank. He couldn't stop looking at Fritz. Not that Fritz was Fritz anymore. Fritz was no longer a goldfish. He no longer had fish scales and fins. No, Fritz was now a mass of squirming sea bonnies. All of Fritz's own parts had been replaced with the tiny gelatinous deformed aquatic rabbits. Mott stared in disbelief and total disgust. As he gaped, he saw a couple of Fritz's scales drifting toward the bottom of the tank. They slowly floated downward until they settled on the rocks. Mott stared at the tiny scales. Those were all that was left of the original Fritz. Mott felt like he was going to be sick. Fritz swam below a cluster of sea bonnies, and Mott swallowed his bile. He made a face and started to turn toward the door, but movement in the tank caught his attention. He glanced back. All the sea bonnies were lined up against the glass, staring at him. Mott ran from Rory's room. Mott spent most of the night, and the better part of the next day, thinking about Fritz. Or actually, not Fritz. All this thinking time wasn't technically needed because he'd reached a conclusion about the body-snatched fish within an hour of leaving Rory's room. Lying on his back in his bed, he'd forced himself to think about what he'd seen. After analyzing it from every angle he could think of, he decided what he'd seen was not some new version of the fish formed out of sea bonnies. It was instead a Fritz imposter. Imposter? A mogul? Sus? <laughs> oh, that's that's funny. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it was a mass of sea bonnies formed to look like Fritz. Why? Because the sea bonnies had consumed Fritz, then used what they'd ingested to multiply themselves and take Fritz's place. Mott had decided they were kind of like f flesh-eating nanobots, which then took on the form of the thing they'd eaten. The day after Mott saw not Fritz for the first time. The day was bright and relentlessly sunny. The weather was all wrong for his mood. 
He thought a stormy day would have been better suited for his dark thoughts. But no matter. His thoughts weren't distracted by the sunshine. By the time Mock got home from school, he'd reached a conclusion. The sea bonnies had to go. Unfortunately, he came to his conclusion too late in the day. If he'd worked this out earlier, he could have cut school to come home and flush the nasty things. But now, Rory was home. And Mott was going to have to figure out a way to get Rory out of his room. No, out of the house. So Mott could dispose of the sea bonnies. Rory now sat at the kitchen counter eating his after-school snack of crackers, cheese, and orange juice. Mott leaned against the counter by the sink and washed his brother's shower crumbs all over his blue shirt and the floor. How about we go outside and toss the ball around, Mott said. It's a nice day. Everyone should be outside. Okay, Rory shouted. I'll go get my mitt. Shoving his last two crackers into his mouth and trailing crumbs behind him, he scurried out of the kitchen. Once they were outside, Mott started working on a plan to keep Rory out of the house, while Mott went back inside and disposed of the sea bonnies. Mott had plenty of time to work on his plan because neither he nor Rory were particularly good at throwing or catching. A lot of time was spent running behind their backyard, chasing the ball. Mott's house sat on the large lot, which backed up on a greenbelt. A thick forest of old oak and maple trees hugged the fence line, and gnarled branches reached into the yard to drop leaves. Uneven grass covered most of the yard. It used to be thick green grass, but when Mott's dad started taking longer flights, which kept him away longer, he stopped doing things like fertilizing and trimming. Moles started burrowing under the lawn, and the yard stayed lumpy, sort of like not Fritz. Mott squinted up at the sun, which was starting to slide toward the horizon. He needed an excuse soon to keep Rory outside. Hey, Rory. A child's voice called from the other side of the wooden fence at the north of the end of the yard. Hey, Danny, Rory called back. He'd been running after the ball, but he abandoned that task and veered toward the wood slats that separated Rory's domain from Danny's. Want to come play ball, Rory shouted. He put his face up to one of the weathered fence boards and peered through a knot hole. Nope, Danny called. Mom and I are taking the pup for his first walk on the leash. Want to come? Yeah, Rory shouted. He turned to look at Mott. Can we? He yelled. He did a typical Rory spastic dance of excitement. Mott grinned. This was perfect. He nodded. You go ahead. I'll stay here and get started on my homework so I'll have more time to play with you later. Cool, Rory shouted. He dropped his mitt and ran toward the gate. I'll keep an eye on them. Danny's mother called through the fence. Thanks, Mrs. Fairchild. Mott charged back into the house as soon as Rory slammed the gate shut and started shouting, What's up, the pup? Mott had a feeling that a walk that included a puppy and two antsy boys wasn't going to be a long one. He needed to hurry. He took the stairs, two at a time, and ran down the hall to Rory's room. Rory's door was open. It was always open during the day. Mott went inside the room and directly to Rory's desk, and he shoved aside a pile of books, reaching for the fish tank. The sound of splashing water stopped him. He looked in the tank. The lid was up, probably because Rory had forgotten to close it after he fed his little maniacal creatures. Mott could see through the glass and from the of the above the water, that the sea bonnies were spun up, violently darting this way and that, creating swirls under the water and rough waves on the top. It was almost as if they knew what he planned to do. Yeah, well, so what? He wasn't going to have to be worried about what they knew and didn't know soon enough. Mott strode to the desk, reached out, and slapped the fish tank lid close. The water inside the tank churned more wildly. The lid vibrated like it was going to pop open. Mott smacked his hand down on top of it, then he used his other hand to put a book on the lid. He looked around and grabbed one of Rory's t-shirts on the floor. Covering the tank with the shirt, because he sure didn't want to look at the sea bonnies as he carried them to their deaths, he pulled the tank toward him and lifted it off the desk. The sound of frothing water got louder. He ignored it. The fish tank was a lot heavier than he expected it to be, but he was strong enough to carry it, barely. From this point, he had to go slowly. He walked methodically and steadily toward the bathroom, and when he got there, he set the fish tank on the counter. He flipped on the light and closed the bathroom door. The toilet seat lid opened with a squeak. Mott turned toward the fish tank. He had to take the t-shirt and the book off the tank now. He wished he had rubber gloves. He didn't want a single drop of the water in the fish tank to touch him. Well, he'd just have to be careful. Mott took off the fish tank's lid, inspected it for errant sea bonnies, found none, and set it aside. Then he ever so carefully began pouring the fish tank's water and the sea bonnies into the toilet bowl. 
Let's go, it's the toilet scene. He half expected to hear whispering as he poured. Would the sea bonnies beg for their lives? Would they try to make him feel guilty or murderous? But he heard nothing. Maybe they were in shock. It was a good thing they didn't try to make him feel bad, because he felt no regret. What he felt was relief. Deep and profound relief. He couldn't empty the entire fish tank into the toilet bowl at once, so he started by pouring as much of the water as he could. While he poured, he flushed. Once he had most of the water gone, he was able to flush the bulk of the sea bonnies together. Then it took one last spill to dump the last of the sea bonnies and poor not Fritz into the toilet. He watched the remaining sea bonnies and not Fritz whirl around the toilet bowl, and as soon as they disappeared and clear water refilled the bowl, he did a fist pump. Yes, he shouted. He looked inside the fish tank to be sure all the sea bonnies were gone. They weren't. One purplish creature was flopping around in the bottom of the tank. Mott quickly held the fish tank under the bathtub faucet. He let about an inch of water run into the tank, and he swished it around. Then he dumped the water, too. He flushed again. Check the fish tank. No sea bonnies. Moving fast again, Mott grabbed a roll of paper towels from under the sink. He also ran down to the kitchen to get his mom's stockpot. It had occurred to him while he was watching the sea bonnies head off to their sewery grave that he should have had a plausible story for why he'd flushed his brother's friends. He'd quickly come up with one. He was going to make it look like he'd been trying to clean the tank, and when he transferred them to the pot, they died. Perhaps poisoned by the stainless steel? Uh, that should work. Rory wouldn't know any better. His mom probably wouldn't either, and she wouldn't care much. She had other things to think about. Even if Rory pitched a fit and went running to his mommy, his mom wouldn't suspect him out of anything. Especially not deliberately disposing of the sea bonnies. She'd just soothe Rory's hurt feelings, and that would be that. Which was almost what happened. The only part of the scenario that didn't play out according to Mott's plan was Rory's reaction. Rory didn't pitch a fit. He didn't throw a tantrum. He didn't go running to his mommy. Instead, he burst into tears, ran into his room, slammed his door, and locked it. Okay, so maybe Mott felt a little bad. He loved his brother, and he didn't want to upset the little guy. Had there been some other way to handle the situation? Mott stood outside his brother's door asking himself this question as he tried to get Rory to come downstairs for dinner. I'm really sorry, buddy, he called through the closed door. I was only trying to help. This much was true. He'd been trying to help himself be free of the sea bodies, for sure, but he also didn't like them being in the same room as his little brother. After all, the loathsome things did shoot down on Fritz. They might be dangerous. What if they bit Rory and gave him an infection? Mom wants you to come down to dinner, Mott called through the closed door. Go away, Rory yelled. I'm not here. Um, okay, Mott said. Then who's yelling at me? Not me, Rory shouted. A chill skittered down Mott's spine. Not me was way too close to not Fritz. The image of a sea bonnie infested Rory flashed through Mott's mind. He shuddered and stepped back from the door. Suit yourself, he called. Mott fell into bed just after 10 p.m., exhausted. Not only had he slept very little the night before, he'd tapped out his en energy with th all the thinking he'd done during the day. The adrenaline rush of vanquishing his enemies, and the struggle to get Rory to open his bedroom door. The, lat the latter part of Mott's tough day had stretched through the evening. Neither his nor his mom's powers of persuasion had been enough to get Rory to open his door. Eventually, it was Rory's need to pee that got his door open. When he finally came out and emptied his bladder, he made two announcements. To his mom, he announced, I'm hungry. I bet you are, she said. That's what happens when you refuse to open your door. She pulled him close. Why don't you come and climb into bed with me, and you can explain it to me why you did what you did, and I'll explain to you why you don't get to do it anymore. If we're both satisfied at the end of the conversation, I'll fix you a snack. Deal? Rory wiped red eyes and nodded. Then he turned to Mott and announced, You're not my brother. Rory, his mom admonished. It's okay, Mom, Mott said. I get it. To Rory, he said, I really am sorry. That was only part of a lie. He wasn't sorry he had flushed the sea bonnies, but he was sorry that Rory was upset. Now, Mott lay in the silent house and wondered if Rory had fallen asleep. Rory had still been crying when their mother put him to bed. The house creaked and outside an owl hooted. Mott turned on his side and looked at his curtain-covered window. His window looked out over the green belt behind the house, and it was right over the roof that covered the back deck. In the summer, he liked to climb out onto that roof and sit in the sun, watching the birds in the trees. It was peaceful. Mott closed his eyes. He realized he was relaxed for the first time since he'd seen the sea bonnies in Rory's tank. 
He exhaled and went to sleep. As soon as he did, he dropped into a dream. Maud sat at the table, eating his cornflakes and reading the last of his English literature assignment. Shoveling in his food, keeping his eye on the pages of his book, he spooned up milk and flakes over and over. As he neared the bottom of the bowl, though, he shifted his gaze from the book to the cereal, and that's when he saw them. Instead of seeing flakes floating in his milk, Maud saw sea bonnies swimming in formation around his bowl. Their squidgy, bluish bodies disgustingly pulsing through the milk, the sea bonnies flipped over and looked at him with itty-bitty black, beady eyes. Mott yelled, gagged, and shoved the bowl away from him. No! Mott's yell followed him out of the dream and into his waking state. He thrashed free of his covers and sat up. The hair in his arms was sticking out, and his heart was pounding hard and fast and loud in his chest. He felt a dry heave come up. He swallowed it down. He started to retch, and he sprang out of his bed and rushed to the bathroom. Afraid his cry might have pulled his mom from a deep sleep, Mott didn't turn on the bathroom light. He didn't want her to worry. He groped in the dark for the glass he knew was next to the sink, ran tap water into the glass, and started chugging it down. When he was halfway through the glass, the water going down Mott's throat suddenly felt clumpy, like it had thickened, or it had somehow had something in it, like a glob of noodles in a bowl of chicken soup. Choking and sputtering, he dropped the glass and he reached for the light. The light came on just as the glass landed in the sink and cracked. Mock quickly shut the bedroom door and scooped up the glass to examine it closely. Holding the glass up to the light, he inspected the water droplets caught on the inside curve. Was anything swimming in the drops? He also studied the crack. Was anything caught in it? He saw nothing but water. Sitting on the closed toilet seat, he thought about what he'd felt in his throat. Had he really felt something, or had he just swallowed wrong? Maybe there had been some toothpaste in the glass. Maybe his mind had just conjured up the sensation because of his dream. Given what he'd done that day, it was easy to assume he'd imagined feeling something slimy slip down his throat. As he freaked out as he was by the sea bodies, it was surprising he could even think about drinking water. Mott picked up the cracked glass and looked at it again. Nope, still nothing. Mott blew out a sigh and headed back into his room. When he opened his eyes the next morning, Mott's logic faced its first foe. His stomach was cramping so badly he could barely get out of bed and go to the bathroom to pee. And when he was done with that, it was all he could do to get back into the bed, curl onto his side, clutch his stomach, and moan. That was where his mother found him when she came in to be sure he was up. Rise and shine, she called out. It's a... Mott? She rushed to the side of the bed. What's wrong? She felt his forehead. Mott hesitated. I'm not sure. I have stomach cramps. Like big ones. I must have eaten something bad last night. His mom frowned at him. What did you eat that we didn't? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Mott thought. All I had yesterday was what you made me for lunch and what we had for dinner. As far as food went, that was the truth. He wasn't about to tell her about thinking he'd swallowed a sea bonnie. That opened a can of worms, or sea bonnies, he didn't want to get into. I'll go get something for your stomach, his mom said. And I'll check on Rory to be sure he's okay. Maybe he's sick too, and that's why he was so upset about his sea bonnies last night. Mott opened his mouth to respond, but another wave of cramping gripped his intestines. And right on the heels of that, the whispers returned. Wuss, the little whispers flung at him. Can't handle swallowing just one. What do you think a hundred would feel like? Two hundred? Two thousand? The whispers morphed into what sounded like hushed giggles. Thousands of them. Mott closed his eyes and pressed his lips together. I'll be right back, his mom said. He heard his mom's footfalls tap across the floor. She was already dressed for work, wearing her high heels. She must have an event today, and here he was making trouble for her. Ma tried to concentrate on his breathing, but between the cramping and the whispers, he couldn't stay focused on it. He couldn't decide which was worse, the horrible cramping or the eerie and relentless whispers. Serves you right, the whispers were saying now. Every bad deed gets punished. Mott's mom reappeared with the chalky medicine she always gave him when his stomach was upset. Rory's fine, she said, pouring Mott a dose. He swallowed it dutifully. But he had a peanut butter sandwich yesterday, his mom said. I'll give you the rest of the lunch meat. It must have gone bad. I'm so, so sorry, honey. It's not your fault, mom, he said, absolutely meaning it. He had no doubt whatever the way he felt had nothing to do with bad lunch meat. Yet it had to do with what had gone down his throat last night. He was sure of it. Convincing himself he'd swallowed Rory's toothpaste had been wishful thinking. You're not as stupid as you look, the whispering voices said. Mott looked up at his mom. I think I just need to go back to sleep. Maybe when I wake up, I'll feel better. He was lying now, both to himself and his mom. Are you sure? I could... She chewed on her lower lip. 
have someone else run the event? No, Mom, you don't need to do that. I'll be fine. She felt his forehead again. You're not hot. In fact, you're actually kind of on the cool side. Chocolate milk, Rory shouted from the hallway. I want chocolate milk for breakfast. Mott cringed at the volume. His mom gave him a half smile. Well, apparently he's gotten over his upset. Good, Mott said. Mom, Rory yelled. I'm coming, she called. She looked at Mott one more time. You're sure you I'll be fine, he lied again. He wasn't at all sure he was going to be fine. The cramps were starting to feel more intense, and the voices were getting more insistent. The whispering wasn't a unison murmur anymore. It was more like the garbled hissing of hundreds of voices all muttering at once. He could no longer make out whole phrases, but he caught a word here and there. Stupid was used frequently. He also heard guilty and murder a few times. Once, he was sure he heard milk sop. Did you hear me? His mom asked. What? Mott curled up tighter as a new spasm clutched at his belly. I said that if you don't feel better when you wake up, be sure to call Ron. I'm going to get on the phone with him before I leave and tell you him you might be needing him. Ron was Dr. T. That was actually a good idea. Mott said so, and then he closed his mouth on the groan that wanted to erupt into the room. In the hallway, Rory shouted, I'm starving. His mom leaned over and kissed Mott on the forehead. Sleep, honey. You'll feel better soon. She crossed to the door, gave him one last look, and left the room. He heard her talking softly to Rory in the hallway. Then he heard Rory's footsteps pounding down the stairs and his mom's tapping heels after that. Mott closed his eyes and tried to sleep. Tried being the operative word. When Mott looked at his bedside digital clock for the 761st time, okay, maybe not quite that many times, but close, at 1.37 in the afternoon, precisely, he gave up trying to convince himself that he was going to feel better soon. It just wasn't going to happen. At 1.38, he got up and went into the bathroom. He thought maybe if he could use the toilet, he'd feel better. Five minutes later, he was back in his bedroom, and he wasn't feeling better. Moaning, he changed into sweats, a t-shirt, and some athletic shoes. He called Dr. T's clinic. Claudia, Dr. T's receptionist, answered. Ma could picture her holding the phone as they spoke. Large and cushy with wild curly hair and kind hazel eyes, Claudia was a caring woman Ma had known as long as he'd known Dr. T. She immediately put Dr. T on the phone. Can you get over here on your own? Dr. T asked. I think I can bike over. Mott struggled to get out. His hesitations weren't entirely caused by stomach cramps. The whispers were getting louder, and they were as distracting as all get out. What he was hearing sounded kind of like someone quickly scanning through radio stations. However, he was hearing snatches of words and phrases instead of snatches of songs. None of them were anything he wanted to listen to. In about 15 minutes, Dr. T said. Sorry, what? I said your voice and your hesitations aren't giving me a lot of confidence in your biking abilities. Claudia's going on her lunch break, and she said she'll swing over to get you. She'll be there in about 15 minutes. Oh, I don't want to... Don't argue with your doctor, Dr. T said. He chuckled. Mott sighed. Thank you. One of the voices whispered, Sucker. Dr. T had exam rooms designed to please the various age groups he focused on. He had some for the little kids, the grade school kids, and the teens. Unfortunately, because Dr. T was squeezing in Mott between other patients, Mott landed in a little kid room. So... When he lay on his back, he was staring up at a ceiling painted with sparkly rainbows, flying purple pigs, and a blue-tinged pegasus that, at the moment, resembled a sea bonnie far more than it should have. It must have been the wings, which looked vaguely like bunny ears. And that bluish-purple color. He never really wanted to see that color again. Mott quickly looked away from the ceiling, turning his head to gaze at the room's walls. They were painted yellow and carved with animal stels- sten- stencils. Mm. Pretty much every imaginable animal had a spot in the room, including a rabbit, which Mott could have sworn was staring at him with animosity. Mott closed his eyes. The paper beneath him crinkled as he shifted to find a semi-comfortable position while Dr. T prodded his belly. Every time Dr. T asked, Does this hurt? Mott gasped, Yes! Dr. T stepped back and sat on his rolling stool. Mott heard the vinyl squeak and the rollers rattle as Dr. T scooted over to the laptop he'd set up at the small counter next to the exam table. Dr. T was kind of a funny-looking guy. This was mostly caused by his big ears and his equally large nose, but a goatee that came to a point under his chin and contributed, too. On top of all this, he was short and totally bald. When Mott and Nate were ten, Dr. T had shaved what remained of his light brown hair. He looked a bit like one of the seven dwarfs, or maybe a gnome. Well, that's not very nice. Uh, We'll leave it at that for now. We'll do the final part very soon. Uh, I'm still not feeling so great, but... I'm feeling better, 
so, you know, we'll get through this. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an alright story. I don't hate it as much as other people do. And I actually like it better, I think, than, I don't know, freaking Dance With Me or something. Dance With Me was ridiculous. I will never get over that. Or He Told Me Everything. Just did not like those. I don't know why. I don't know why. That's my opinion. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for listening. See you soon.